Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at antibodies, all the different parts of the antibodies, how they're produced and how they work for your A-level biology. Antibodies. Antibodies are proteins which bind to antigens forming an antibody-antigen complex. Antibodies are proteins that have quaternary structure because they're made up of more than one polypeptide chain. They're actually made up of four different polypeptide chains joined together by disulfide bridges. There are two heavy chains. You can see them in the long ones in the middle. And then there are the two light chains. They're obviously lighter because they're slightly shorter and they're on the outside. And you can see here the disulfide chains joining them together. There's two joining together the two heavy chains and one joining together the light chain to one of the heavy chains. There is an area in the middle called the hinge region. This allows the antibody to be flexible because there are two antigen binding sites and sort of two arms of the antibody. And being able to kind of bend allows those two arm points to kind of stretch and bend apart from each other. Each chain has a constant region, which is identical in all antibodies, and then a variable region, which is up near the antigen binding site. The variable region gives the antibody its specific tertiary structure that makes it complementary to one type of antigen. So although the majority of the constant region of all antibodies is identical, you have this variable region, which is where we get that variability that makes each antibody specific and able to bind to one specific antigen. The reason it's useful to have this constant region, so the majority of the heavy chain and just a small part of the light chains, is because then that bottom part where the heavy chains are means that antibodies are able to bind to common receptor sites that are on all cells, specifically helpful for things like the immune system cells. We need to know that there are three ways in which antibodies work to help the body to destroy pathogens. One way is agglutination. This is where antibodies bind to antigens on pathogens. And because each antibody can bind two antigens at once, they can actually begin to clump together pathogens. So one antibody could actually bind and join two pathogens together. And if lots of antibodies do this, they form a clump. This then makes it easier for a phagocyte to come along and engulf more than one pathogen at once. And so it just speeds up that digestion of those pathogens. Antibodies are also able to neutralize toxins. Some antibodies will be complementary and be able to bind to toxins, which are molecules produced by pathogens that can do damage to the cells in the body. And by binding to them, it neutralizes them. So it stops them having any effect. Opsonization. This is where these antibodies bind to antigens on pathogens and then they act as binding sites for phagocytes. So it basically attracts phagocytes, it increases the pathogen's chance of being engulfed and destroyed. So these can actually be quite generic antibodies. So we're used to having antibodies that have a really specific variable region that binds to a specific single antigen. But actually, these ones, because their really idea is to bind to anything that could be a foreign pathogen or a foreign particle, then they can be quite generic. So something as simple as binding to some of the proteins or the carbohydrates in the bacterial cell wall. And so then that means they'll bind to any bacteria. They don't have to be specific and it's just there. So that once they're bound, the other end of the antibody, the kind of non-variable end that's normally consistent across antibodies will then attract the phagocytes. Another use for the antibodies known as opsonins is neutralization. So these are ones that are slightly more specific and they can bind to antigens on pathogens that are useful to the pathogen. So they could be obviously an antigen is a protein on the outside of a cell. So these could be attachment proteins. They could be the proteins that allow them to bind to the host or to enter or put their DNA, if they're a virus, for example, put their DNA inside the host cell. So if 
the antibody can bind to that specific attachment protein or that specific receptor, which is obviously an antigen, then it can deactivate it. So it can stop the pathogen from being able to enter the cell, stop the pathogen from being able to inject its DNA into the cell and therefore neutralize it, which is why it's called neutralization. So those are the names of the processes and these are the names of the types of antibodies. So agglutinins are the type of antibody that do agglutination. Antitoxins are obviously the ones that neutralize the toxins. Opsonins do the opsonization and also opsonins do neutralization, depending on the type of opsonin because there's a group of them. Antigenic variation. Now we mentioned this when we were talking about the primary and the secondary immune response. So it's really important that we understand how antigens can be very vital to what type of immune response the body is going to put out and how pathogens have evolved alongside humans and our immune systems to be able to try and evade our immune systems. So memory B cells are able to produce a secondary immune response when they encounter a pathogen with exactly the same antigens that we have had inside our bodies before. This is because the antibodies that that memory B cell is able to make have a complementary shape to that antigen. And so when we make a load of those antibodies, they're going to quickly be able to bind to that pathogen and its antigens or the toxin or whatever it is that it does and be able to stop it. Some pathogens are able to form different strains. So the pathogen is the same. For example, influenza virus is the same virus, it is still the influenza virus, it's not a different virus completely, but there's a different strain because there'll be some minor genetic mutations which are able to change the shape of the antigens on the surface of that pathogen. This is called antigenic variation. And you can see here that I've got pathogen A and then it's gone through antigenic mutation and it's still pathogen A, but the antigen is now changed slightly. It no longer has that pointed shape. Instead, we've kind of chopped the top of that triangle off and we have a more flat shape. So if I was infected again with pathogen A after the mutation, although it's still the same pathogen, the antigens have changed. So I wouldn't trigger a secondary immune response. I would go back to having to trigger a primary immune response because the B cells will not recognize this pathogen anymore because the antigens are different. And even if it did produce antibodies, then they would not be able to bind to this pathogen and have any effect because the shape of their variable region is no longer complementary to this antigen. It means that especially if no B cells are activated, then they won't go through mitosis and they won't produce antibodies anyway because they wouldn't be activated by this antigen in any way. We need to be able to describe both the primary and the secondary immune response. So often it's depicted as a graph that looks like this, where we have the antibody concentration in the blood and then the amount of time along the bottom. So that initial point at the start of the graph is when you're first infected with a new antigen. So something that you've not been infected with before, a new pathogen that you haven't been sick with. And then this triggers what we call the primary immune response. So you'll see there's an increase in concentration in antibodies in the blood, but it's quite a slow increase and there's not a lot of antibodies. This is because there's not many B cells made to produce the antibodies because that B cell is just roaming around and there's not necessarily many B cells that have this receptor for this antigen. And then when they divide, we don't make loads straight away. The response is also slow because we have to go through that cell mediated response part first in order to get T cells, which can then activate the B cells. It's also short term. So you can see that as the graph, it starts to drop off before we get to the dashed line. So that means the number of antibodies is actually dropping off because they don't stay in the blood for a very long time. They only last a few days. At this point, just before the second peak, that's when we're going to be reinfected with the same antigen. So this is important. It has to be the same antigen as was infected in the first part of the graph. And then we're going to get what we call the secondary immune response because it'll be the second time we've come across this pathogen or the antigen in the body. So we get a much steeper, faster increase in antibody concentration and the drop off is much slower. So this is kind of the features of how you recognize the secondary immune response. This is because more antibodies are being produced much faster because all we're doing is relying on those memory cells to rapidly start dividing the memory B cells, rapidly start dividing, forming plasma cells, which are going to be producing lots of the antibody. 
more memory cells will also be produced and these stay in the blood for longer and then are able to keep producing antibodies if needed by dividing to form plasma cells again. This means the immunity is slightly longer term and you get that slower drop off of the amount of antibodies in the blood. And like I said, the important thing here is that we only get that secondary immune response if you're reinfected with exactly the same antigen. Now, pathogens can be sneaky and they can change the shape of the antigens on their surface. So it's not always going to be necessarily a secondary immune response if you get infected with the same pathogen. It has to be the same antigen. And we'll look at antigenic variation next. Ouch! This is why in some videos I explain scratches. 